Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's nice to see some uh, friendly uh, older faces, uh, for older friends, and also uh, new, new faces and friends uh, out there. Uh, I'm very excited about uh, my new book, be book being published. I've been working probably 27 years uh, on this, uh, and it, it's actually that's a bigger uh, lifetime than it takes to, uh, to have a baby born. This, this is a very, very long labor. <clears throat> I'm going to share a few thoughts before I show some slides. And basically what I'll be doing tonight um, is sharing some of the stories that are in this book. And uh, for the last 60 years, I've had the uh, amazing opportunity to be a part of nonviolent movements and experimenting with the power of nonviolence in this country and around the world. And I feel that one of our problems today is uh, people, many people have given up hope that we can make any difference, that we can really make change. And my hope is that with this book uh, and sharing these stories, uh, that people will be inspired that we can make a difference. Our nation and our world are addicted to violence and war. <clears throat> this has brought the, the untold, untold suffering and death to millions of people and uh, to hundreds of millions more who have had to flee their homes as refugees and has cost trillions of dollars in, uh, in money down the rat hole of war, which is not available for meeting human environmental needs, both in this country and around the world. And yet we continue that addiction. It's as if there's no alternative to war and violence as a way of resolving conflict. And I believe uh, that just as we ended slavery, just as we've ended cannibalism, as we ended uh, women being second-class citizens, as we uh, ended Jim Crow in the south of this country, uh, we can end war. And maybe that's a radical thought, <clears throat> but we, uh, I'm a part of something called uh, World Beyond War, building a global movement to end all war. And if you're interested, uh, we'll be si sending around a, a sign-up sheet uh, where you can sign a declaration of peace, that you will not participate in war, and that you will work nonviolently to end all war. <clears throat> and you can look at our website, worldbeyondwar.org, to learn a whole lot more. The good news is that, I th that people all over the world are discovering the power of nonviolent action, and nonviolent means to resist uh, oppression, dictatorship, uh, war and violence of all kinds. <clears throat> In the last 40, 50 years, more than half the world's people uh, live in countries where there have been major nonviolent movements. And many of those have been successful. I commend to you, in addition to my book, <laughs> a book called Why Civil Resistance Works by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan where they have uh, studied 323 violent and nonviolent movements over the, last, uh, over the last 110 years and found the nonviolent movements to be more than twice as likely to be successful. So for people that say, if nothing else works, uh, try violence and war, uh, this should put an end <laughs> to that discussion. And in addition to being twice as likely to be successful, most of those movements have ended up in, in democracy and uh, not in further civil war or more dictatorship. So uh, that's another book to put on your, uh, re your reading list. I've had the, I had the good fortune, uh, one, to choose uh, good parents, uh, but also to have in my life what I call spiritual giants people that uh, were walking their talk and were 
uh, using their lives to really try to create a more peaceful and just world and experiment, experiment with the power of nonviolence. Those include Bayard Rustin, Martin Luther King, uh, Ralph Abernathy, A.J. Musty, uh, and many others. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I think we'll uh, get on with the slides, uh, which, will, which are photos uh, that are in the book and uh, basically uh, illustrate uh, some of the stories. Partly influenced by meeting Martin Luther King in Montgomery, Alabama during the Montgomery bus boycott, I, uh, and my and encouragement by my friend Bayard Rustin, who organized the March on Washington in 1963, I decided to uh, go to Howard University, which was a black university in Washington, D.C. And I started there in the fall of 1959, and in February of 1960, soon after, four students down in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, decided, found their courage, and uh, decided to challenge segregation in the South. And, and went to a lunch counter, very much like this, uh, were not served, and uh, were uh, arrested and sent to jail. Well, at Howard University, which was almost totally a black university, uh, we uh, did a little research and found that in Maryland and Virginia, everything was segregated. Uh, lunch counters, restaurants, uh, motels, drinking fountains, uh, toilets, uh, movie theaters, playgrounds. And we started going up to Maryland to challenge some of the uh, to go into the lunch counters to challenge the segregation laws there. We usually went on Saturday morning, would uh, be arrested, they'd take us to jail, and we'd spend the weekend singing, singing freedom songs. And uh, on Monday morning, would get released and go back to classes. Well, the state of Virginia had passed a law saying anybody that challenged that law in Virginia could get six months in prison and $500 fines. So for quite a while, we kept going to Maryland. And finally, in June of 1960, after our final exams, nobody had challenged that law, and we decided somebody has to. So we went down to what was called a People's Drug Store, which is a chain in the Washington area, uh, and sat down at this lunch counter to get something to eat. That's me on the far right. They, they closed the lunch counter and uh, would not serve us, but the uh, owner didn't want us arrested. He didn't want the bad publicity. So we, uh, we st sat there for two days, waiting for something to eat. And it was the most challenging two days of my life. Uh, people came and spat at us. People put lit cigarettes down our backs. People. Uh, punched us in the stomach so hard uh, we would fall off the, off the stool and then they would kick us. Every time something like this would happen, we would try to respond in a nonviolent, loving way, uh, which was pretty challenging sometimes. Toward the end of the second day, I was uh, meditating on loving your enemies, and I heard a guy come up from behind me and he says, if you don't get out of the store in two seconds, I'm going to stab this through your heart. And in his hand was a switchblade. And uh, by that time, it was pretty close to my heart. And I thought, oh, I've got two seconds. Uh, do I really believe in nonviolence, or is there something else that I should be doing here? But we'd had a lot of practice, and I just looked him in the eyes, and I said, a friend, do what you believe is right, but I'll still try to love you. And it was quite uh, amazing. This face that was contorted with hatred, his jaw began to drop, and his hand began to fall, and he left the store. So for a 20-year-old, this was kind of a, an amazing experience. We then did something even more difficult. Uh, it had been in the front page of the papers, and there were 500 people gathered outside threatening violence, uh, including the American Nazi Party. And we 
uh, wrote a statement appealing to the religious and community leaders of Arlington to use their influence to get the eating facilities open to everyone. And then this is the difficult part. We said, if nothing changes, within a week we'll be back. And uh, that was challenging. Uh, well, some friendly media people got us out alive and took us back to Washington, and we literally shook for six days whether we had the courage to go back and do this again. On the sixth day, uh, we got a phone call that the religious and community leaders had met, had talked with the business leaders, and had gotten a commitment that the eating facilities would be open within 10 days. So this was the most important uh, lesson of my life, that when something terrible is happening, you don't have to just curse the television set or the president or segregation or war. Uh, we can really, we have the power to help change history. And that's what uh, black students throughout the South were doing. And I, I think those religious and community leaders could have, could have met and uh, used their influence to get the eating facilities open 25, 50, 100 years earlier. But somehow we'd touch something in their heart uh, that encouraged them to act. <laughs> this, is the <clears throat> this is the next year in, uh, in Berlin, where I was studying at the universities of East and West Berlin. This is what you call the University of the Streets. Uh, this was Checkpoint Charlie, and on this side are the American tanks facing toward the east. On the, the other side are the Soviet tanks facing uh, the west. And I was studying, as I say, in both universities, east and west Berlin, which, as, I, as far as I know, I may have been one of the few Americans or anybody that actually did that. And I would ride my bicycle through the Checkpoint Charlie each morning, uh, go to the University in East Berlin, and when I would hear what I considered communist propaganda, I would challenge that, and they, were, they called me a capitalist warmonger. In the afternoon, I would come back to West Berlin, and uh, when I heard uh, Western propaganda, I would uh, challenge that propaganda, and they'd call me a communist conspirator. So I learned fairly early on but that telling the truth or questioning authority, questioning the official propaganda is not, is not necessarily uh, popular. Well, the, the US and the Soviet Union were, uh, were threatening nuclear war over Berlin that year and for a number of years. And it was, it was very, very scary. Uh, I then heard that you could go camping in the Soviet Union. Uh, and the, the, the Russian people at that time were our arch enemy. These were the people that we were ready to incinerate, kill hundreds of millions of them if need be, and they the same with us. So I heard you could go camping in Russia, and I uh, got a VW Bug, and five, of, five students went, uh, and these, this is in one of the campgrounds, some of the Russian people that we were meeting, and as you can tell, they, uh, they look like evil communists. But uh, if our governments won't make peace, I think it's up to us, the people, to try to make peace. One of my concerns for a long time has been nuclear weapons testing. Uh, I had been arrested in May of 1962, uh, uh, or perhaps it was April of 62, in front of the White House, uh, praying for an end to nuclear weapons testing and spent a, a weekend in jail. And later that summer, I was leading a second group to uh, the Soviet Union and uh, decided that American bomb tests <laughs> are horrendous and the Soviet nuclear testing are horrendous. And so I made a sign in Russian saying, bomb, bomb tests kill people. And here we are in the Kremlin next to the London Mausoleum with St. Basil's in the background uh, demonstrating against Soviet nuclear bombs. Well, the Americans had said, when we were demonstrating in Washington, our bomb tests are just for peace, peaceful purposes. Uh, go to Russia. And so here we were in Russia, and the Russian people's response was very similar. 
our bomb tests are, are just peaceful, and uh, why don't you go to the United States? Well, the Soviet police came and threatened us with 20 years in prison, and uh, after <laughs> thinking about that for a second, we said, well, thank you for warning us, but if, these, if this nuclear arms race continues, uh, all of us may be dead. And we've demonstrated in the United States, and we're going to demonstrate here. Luckily, they didn't arrest us, but uh, they actually kept me out of the country for 26 years. <coughs> also, that spring in 62, uh, six of us Quakers had the opportunity to meet with President Kennedy for about half an hour in the White House. And here we're having a press conference out in front of the White House when we came out. And it was very impressive to us that the president actually was listening. And uh, he said to us, among other things, he says, I've been reading the guns of August and b before the First World War, and everyone armed to the teeth to try to keep us out of war. And that's exactly what has got into war. And it's scary, the similarities between what was happening then and what's happening now in 1962. Uh, which uh, we found out that fall <laughs> when we were uh, eye to eye in uh, a possible nuclear destruction over the Cuba Missile Crisis. Well, we also challenged him to, uh, to challenge the Soviets to a, a peace race uh, and, and to take more leadership to lead us against, away from this uh, nuclear Armageddon. And he, he looked at us and he said, I, if you're serious about this, you're going to have to build a much more powerful uh, movement to help encourage me and support me to, do, uh, to take the leadership you want me to take. Well, we kind of had our, our marching orders, and when his secretary came and said, Mr. President, your next, secretary, your next appointment's here, uh, he said, well, tell them to wait. I'm learning something from these Quakers. This is during the Vietnam War, I think it was about 1969, and uh, some Quakers uh, were reading the names of the war dead each uh, Wednesday at noon on the Capitol steps. Well, we'd get through 40 or 50 names and the police would arrest us uh, for causing, disturbing the war, maybe we would call it that. And uh, after about three weeks, I went to see Congressman George Brown, who's standing here, and said, uh, Congressman, uh, we've been arrested three weeks now for trying to read the names of the war dead. Is there anything you can do to help us? And he said, yeah, I think I'll join you. And uh, in addition, I will write to every member of Congress telling them that I'm joining you and to invite them to join us. So the next day, we had three members of Congress out there. And when all of us were arrested, uh, the, the three congressmen had congressional immunity and uh, kept reading the 45,000 names the war did. Well, that got uh, national publicity, and uh, within a couple of weeks, Life magazine had a whole issue uh, with a photo of every American that had been killed in the war, uh, where they were born, where they went to school, uh, where they died, etc. And within a couple of weeks, uh, people all over the country were reading the names of the war dead uh, at federal buildings, at courthouses, uh, at post offices. So uh, even a few people can you know, begin <laughs> making ripples in the water. Uh, this is Jan, my wife Jan and me, and you see our daughter Heidi and our, our son Peter is right behind the uh, policeman. This is also during the... Uh, bombing of uh, Vietnam, the war in Vietnam, and 250 Quakers uh, had decided to have a, a quiet meeting for worship in front of the White House. President Nixon was the president, and the police came and warned us all that we would be arrested if we didn't leave. No one left, and the 250 other Quakers were all hauled, hauled off to jail. Uh, Jan and I and our two young children uh, we're left there sitting on the sidewalk, and this is the police chief uh, threatening to, that if we were arrested, uh, 
the, our children would be taken away and put in juvenile hall. And he says, you know what happens to children in juvenile hall. And we said, uh, well, of course we love our children, but we also love the children of Vietnam. And uh, we are going to continue uh, this worshipful presence in front of the White House until we stop bombing children in Vietnam. Well, he went on for a while longer. For about half an hour, he was trying to convince us uh, to leave. And after half an hour, I said, well, if you arrest us, we will walk to the police car. Well, he says, you're under arrest. And we walked to the police car. And uh, instead of taking us to jail, he took us behind the police station in Georgetown and released us. And we, we, we walked back to the White House, but uh, by that time, the police were everywhere, and we couldn't get anywhere near the White House. This photo was, went all across the country. Uh, the 250 Quakers got very, very little publicity, but somehow this young family uh, seemed to be very photogenic. So people from all over the country sent us this photo, because UPI and AP uh, had sent it out. And uh, it's now in our, baby, our children's baby books. Some people think that when you get married and have children, you give up your uh, values and your beliefs, and we can actually do something to uh, stop uh, war and madness. And that somehow never, we never had that problem. This picture is taken uh, in uh, 1972. Uh, in Christmas of 1971, the United States started bombing Hanoi and Haiphong. We'd been bombing rice paddies and the Ho Chi Minh Trail and uh, small towns and villages. But uh, at, Chris at Christmas time, we started bombing these cities with millions of people. And we had a, a, a worship service in West Philadelphia where, where we were living and tried to, to feel the pain of the people that were living under those bombs, what this meant uh, to them, to their families, not knowing if uh, their children would be alive tomorrow, uh, the, if, some of the, if the parents were killed, where could the parents, children go, et cetera. And then we tried to look at what are we led to do to try to stop this insanity. And we somehow found the courage to uh, somehow put our bodies between these bombs and the people in uh, Vietnam. And we found 26 canoes, and 52 of us began uh, attempting to nonviolently blockade the ship, which was called the USS Nitro. On the first day, as we paddled out along the pier uh, toward the uh, bow of the ship, uh, a, a, a policeman, uh, a, a military policeman, warned us over the megaphone, uh, you've got to get out of this area or, you, or you'll be charged with criminal conspiracy. And that's 20 years in prison. We, we tried to yell back, uh, thank you for warning us, but if these bombs uh, reach their destination, that's even worse than 20 years in prison. On the sixth day that we were out there, we'd heard the, the ship was going to be leaving very early that morning. The decks were piled 15, 20 feet high with napalm and personnel bombs. And when we looked up at the bow of the ship as they were lifting anchor, here were a number of the sailors giving us the V sign. And then seven of the sailors jumped off of the ship into the ocean and began uh, swimming toward our uh, blockade, which <laughs> was, uh, was a phenomenal experience for us, something we di didn't anticipate at all. We'd call the New York Times and the evening news. So this was broadcast across the country. These guys were put back, they were picked up and put back on the brig of the ship. But they told us later that when their ship went through the Panama Canal, all the other Navy ships had heard about the USS Nitro and the nonviolent resistance and gave them the fist of solidarity uh, with those seven sailors. 
So I like to think that our courage gave those seven sailors courage to do what they believed was right. And those seven sailors gave courage to a whole lot of other Americans in the war uh, to stop the insanity of what they were having been ordered to do in killing, burning villages, and that kind of thing. So again, the ripple effect. You know, you can throw a little stone in the water and you never know where it ends. Well, that blockade uh, at Leonardo, New Jersey, uh, spread all up and down the East Coast and all up and down the West Coast. This is down in Norfolk, Virginia. That's an aircraft carrier of the USS America and some of our small canoes in front of it. And uh, the uh, Navy fireboats came with their water cannon, and we thought they were going to aim at us, but they aimed at the sailors who were giving us support. Uh, and uh, we were all, they, they capsized our boats intentionally. Uh, the frogmen came after us, put us onto the, a Navy boat face down in handcuffs with guns pointed at us uh, while the USS America steamed out to Vietnam. The next day, the local paper had a, a headline saying, America defeats peace flotilla. So you know, finally, America was standing tall again. Uh, I'm going to skip some of these. Uh, this is uh, at, at Livermore Nuclear Weapons Labs, which is about 35 miles east of San Francisco. Uh, the United States uh, has been and is developing a whole new generation of nuclear bombs. I think $10 billion is to be spent this year just on no, new nuclear weapons development. So we have been involved in an ongoing campaign since the early uh, 80s. Uh, people in the religious community and students and uh, people from many different uh, communities uh, working for the conversion of that plant from nuclear weapons to uh, alternative energy and positive uh, contributions to the world. I'll skip that one too. This is uh, at Concord Naval Weapons Station. Uh, also uh, a little bit northeast of, of San Francisco. And uh, at this weapons station, 80% of the bombs that went to, to uh, Vietnam were shipped. And this is in 80, 1987. Uh, unfortunately, we were now sending arms to Central America, to El Salvador, to, to Guatemala, to the Contras in Nicaragua. And Brian Wilson, how many of you have heard of Brian Wilson? Uh, who is a Vietnam vet who, uh, in Vietnam, part of his job was to uh, go into villages after we'd bombed to look at how effective the bombing had been. And uh, he went into one of the villages one day, and here, all of the, the only people that were there were women and children and old people, all of them dead. No weapons uh, were found. And there was this one woman whose, whose eyebrows had been, and eyelashes had been burned by napalm. So her eyes were looking white, you know, right at him. And around her legs were her children, uh, uh, wrapping their arms around their mother, all of them dead. And Brian, who had been brought up a very uh, staunch anti-communist uh, John Birch Society, uh, started wondering, why am I 9,000 miles away from home uh, in somebody else's, <laughs> burning somebody else's village? Well. That was kind of a conversion experience for him. But here we were, he'd gone to Nicaragua and finding that we were doing the same thing again. And that was just too much for him, and he came back. And we decided to, to organize what we called Nuremberg Actions, where we were uh, going to nonviolently try to block trucks and trains that were carrying bombs to, to kill people in Central America. And this is uh, Dorothy Granada and me blocking one of the first trucks. Uh, and all, and the, all of them were labeled explosives. So, you know, you could very easy. Well, and they were coming from munitions bunkers uh, up on the hills, crossing this, uh, this roadway, 
uh, taking them out to ships. Well, on September, 20, September 1st of that year, uh, Brian and a number of other uh, veterans, uh, Vietnam veterans, uh, made a statement in which they said, starting September 1st, we'll be fasting for 40 days, and we will be uh, blocking uh, the trains that are carrying bombs to Central America. And the, the Navy has three choices. You can stop shipping the bombs, or you can arrest us, uh, take us to jail, but we want you to know that the moment you, you release us, we'll be back on the tracks or you can run over us. And he also said, our lives are not worth more than the people of Central America, and their lives are not worth less than ours. And I think that's a very radical way of looking at the world. I think many of us think somehow our lives are more important than people in other parts of the world. And it's all right for us to consume six times our share of the world's resources. And it's all, all right to bomb their country if we want their oil or, or other resources. Well, the Navy unfortunately decided uh, to run, through, run their train through us, through our blockade. And that's the train in the background after it's run through, gone through. Brian has been run over by the train, lost his two legs, a hole in his head, 50 bones broken, but was still alive. And I'm there trying to hold the blood in his head it was the worst day of my life. Uh, obviously, I think what the Navy was trying to do was to say, <laughs> no more of this nonsense from you guys. Uh, but in instead, we had 9,000 uh, people out there the next Saturday to uh, commit to uh, continuing this action. Brian survived, and actually, I visited him in the hospital where every inch of his body was covered with bandages and no more legs but I could see his eyes, and uh, he dictated this most beautiful statement. Uh, his love and his, his commitment to nonviolence and his commitment to building a different kind of world where we could all be brothers and sisters was stronger than ever. And he says, I'll be back there at the tracks as soon as I can get out of this hospital. Well, we had 9,000 people there the next Saturday, and then we blocked every train uh, for three years. And sometimes uh, they would have to arrest two busloads of us uh, before the train could go through. And word about what we did went throughout Central America. And for the, for the peasants and the local people, uh, it was so meaningful that there are Americans that are willing to risk their lives to stop the insanity of the killing that was happening in their families and their communities. This is my mom and dad, Ruth and Ray Hartso, uh, just taken just before we were all uh, arrested uh, out at Concord Naval Weapons Station blocking a train. Uh, this is uh, in the Soviet Union, and uh, this was the year I was allowed to go back to the Soviet Union after uh, 26 years of exile, so to speak. And uh, there had been a right-wing very reactionary communist coup d'etat against Gorbachev, who had been making signs of detente with the West and Glasnost, uh, making it you know, much, much more democratic, et cetera. Well, this coup d'etat had all the Soviet military forces at their command, all their nuclear weapons, the Air Force, and declared a total curfew. And, uh, but in spite of that, about 10,000 Russian citizens uh, went to the White House, which you see behind us there, uh, surrounding it, and they called it the Living Ring, uh, to nonviolently um, face the tanks that had been ordered to come and shoot. And uh, people would uh, offer the, the uh, soldiers uh, food, water, cig cigarettes, saying, you are our, you are our sons. Uh, you are brothers, uh, please don't shoot. And many of those, uh, those soldiers in the tanks turned the tanks around and faced out. Uh, the Air Force came and also had orders to bomb the White House. Uh, when they saw all these people, they refused to bomb. After three days and three nights, uh, the coup leaders gave up 
and uh, some of them uh, committed suicide, and Gorbachev was brought back from uh, prison. This is in Kosovo in 1996, uh, which uh, you may remember there was a very apartheid kind of system there. 90% of the people were Kosovar Albanian, and about 7% were Serbian, and the 90% of the people had all been fired from their jobs, could not speak Albanian, they could not go to the university. Um, they were afraid to go to hospitals because some of them had been poisoned. But the people were responding nonviolently to that, that oppression. And I had just come from Sarajevo where there had been bombing of Sarajevo for over two years. And everywhere was fresh grave sites. And I heard that there was nonviolent resistance in uh, Kosovo and I uh, decided I want to go there and find out more what's happening. Well, almost everybody in that society that I met, women, uh, students, uh, professors, uh, former polit political prisoners, political party people said, Kosovo is an explosion waiting to happen. We need to engage in more active nonviolent resistance, but we need to have international people to come and accompany us. David, can you find those people? And I said, well, I will try. And so I traveled around uh, Europe, around the United States, and spoke, wrote articles and spoke on radio and television, saying Kosovo is an explosion waiting to happen. Uh, they, they want to engage in more active nonviolent resistance, but they need international accompaniment. Can you come? And most people said, where is Kosovo? Because there would not, not been a war there. And uh, the others said, well, it sounds very important, but we're too busy. So uh, when, when it did explode and there was ethnic cleansing, President Clinton got on television and said, there's ethnic cleansing happening in Kosovo. Uh, we have two choices. We can look the other way and do nothing, or we can go in and start bombing. And many of us that had, had known the situation uh, in Kosovo realized there was a third alternative which was supporting that nonviolent movement, which I think could have uh, helped bring about the nonviolent transformation that was needed there uh, without the billions of dollars that was spent on uh, bombing and without the, uh, the death and destruction and without the hatred that intensified on all sides. So that to me was a very uh, a moral wake up call. We need a global nonviolent peace force of hundreds and eventually thousands of nonviolent peacemakers and peacekeepers that can go in to support nonviolent movements and civilian populations that are endangered by war. So the nonviolent peace, this is Mel Duncan and me, who uh, together with many others were the co-founders of the nonviolent peace force. And the nonviolent peace force now has uh, about 200 uh, trained uh, international peace workers working in uh, areas of conflict where we've been invited by local peacemakers and human rights workers. And this is in Sri Lanka, but we now have about 200 people in Mindanao in the Philippines, in uh, South Sudan, in Burma, and we're exploring a possible role in uh, South Sudan, in, uh, in Syria. Uh, this is just, uh, this is Market Street in San Francisco, where uh, when the U.S. started our shock and awe campaign in, uh, military campaign in Iraq, uh, we were able to shut down uh, the financial district for three days uh, when this war started. And on, the, on March 19th, the anniversary of that, each year we have uh, had a die-in representing the people that are dying in Iraq. This is Kosovo, where I uh, visited this last April. Excuse me, uh, Jeju Island in uh, Korea. And uh, Jeju Island is a place where there's been resistance to militarism for uh, decades. They were uh, resisting the Japanese occupation. And then when the Americans came in uh, after the Second World War, they resisted the building a separate anti-communist state in South Korea. They wanted a unified uh, Korea. 
And so 50,000 of uh, the, the citizens, uh, unarmed citizens, were killed uh, in Jeju Island. Now, uh, the US military, as part of our uh, pivot to Asia, is, uh, is building, together with the Korean Navy, is building a massive new military base as part of surrounding China uh, with military bases. And the people of this community have been resisting, uh, nonviolently blocking trucks and cement trucks for seven years, uh, and bulldozers. Uh, and here you see some of the folks there. Um, there are nonviolent movements in many parts of the world uh, saying no to military madness and occupation and uh, military bases, etc. Uh, this is Iran, and uh, I, I've led two uh, fellowship of reconciliation de uh, delegations to Iran in the last years. Iran is kind of one of our new quote enemies. Uh, these women don't look like enemies, uh, but we're very happy to, to, as almost all the people of Iran. We're very happy to meet Americans who want to reach out and get to know each other as, as human beings. Being in a place like Iran, uh, I mean, our government considers them the enemy. But when, when we've tried to put ourselves, ourselves in the other person's shoes, uh, Iran has not invaded another country for 200 years. The United States overthrew their democratically elected government in 1953. We uh, shot down a civilian Iranian civilian airliner uh, several years ago, never apologized. We have surrounded their country with military bases and are bombing in Iraq and Afghanistan and have military ships off the coast. But we're considering them a threat to our security. So uh, again, I think it's, it's the people of the world that are going to force, have to force our governments to uh, say, we're not going to put up with war and, uh, and killing and threats of uh, massive destruction. Uh, this is Gaza, uh, also led a delegation to Israel-Palestine. And the most, uh, I think, hopeful thing that's going on in that whole conflict right now is that Palestinians in the West Bank are nonviolently uh, challenging the wall that is separating them from their, from their fields. And uh, week after week, every Friday at noon, after the, uh, the worship service at the mosque on, on Friday noon, they, would, uh, they are marching to the wall to demand that it be at least moved, if not removed, uh, uh, totally, and get get hit with uh, rubber bullets and tear gas. Uh, some of them have been uh, deadly uh, injured. This is in Gaza after the Israeli uh, shot, uh, what they called Operation Cast Lead, and this woman, whose home had also been uh, largely destroyed, was pointing out the, the, the photographs of 28 of her family members who had been uh, killed in that that attack. This is uh, in uh, part of the Occupy movement in Washington, D.C., uh, where Tom Yule joined us and uh, Ruth and Mike Yarrow, and where many, many people, and especially young people, thousands of people throughout this country, uh, decided to wake up and say, uh, we really want a government of, by, and for the people, all the people, uh, not just the wealthy and the corporations. Uh, this is another action of the Peace Navy. Uh, that's a South African ship uh, during the apartheid era. And uh, in addition to uh, the Peace Navy, we had, uh, we had a picket line. And out in front where the workers were, were going to unload the ship, uh, the longshoremen refused to cross the picket line. And uh, the ship never got unloaded in San Francisco. It then went to Portland, where it was not unloaded, and then to, to Seattle, 
Uh, longshoremen refused to cross picket lines in all those places. More recently, as you, I'm sure you know, Israeli ships, the same thing has happened. This is, to me, one of the symbols of hope at Fort Detrick, Maryland, um, in, Fre in Frederick, Maryland, there was a uh, biological warfare plant. This is back in 1959. And at this, bi at this uh, biological warf plant, warfare plant, the US was developing something called Q fever. Two ounces of Q fever could kill everyone in the world if, if distributed evenly. And uh, Quakers and others began a silent vigil at the entrance to the space. And my mother, the, the third from the right in the white dress, uh, was a school teacher and went down in her uh, summer vacations to be a part of this vigil. The, the base had ordered its, all the workers not to take any leaflets, not to look at these people, to look straight ahead and go into work each morning. <coughs> Well, 10 years later, my folks uh, moved to Salem, Oregon, and my mom was in a bookstore one day, and uh, a guy came up to her and said, were you in that vigil at Fort Detrick 10 years ago? And she says, yes. And he said, well, I want you to know it's because of you and the other people there that, uh, that I resigned my job. So we never know. Uh, you know, if we do a small witness, hold a candle, <laughs> hold a sign, uh, write a letter to, uh, you know, Congress, uh, that that can start ripples going far beyond what we'll even know about. And this is uh, I, my final slide, I guess, that I'll show. Back where I showed the American and the Soviet tanks, uh, I went back after the wall that had been torn down by the people on both sides. And instead of the tanks, uh, here was this massive billboard with Gandhi's photo up at the top, and then Walensa uh, down below, and pointing to a museum half a block away from Gandhi to Walensa, uh, the history of nonviolent struggle around the world. And I thought that this was uh, quite a beautiful uh, uh, transformation <laughs> from threatening nuclear war to celebrating nonviolent resistance all over the world. Well, I will end by just saying, uh, well, this is a, a drone base, which also, as you perhaps know, this is the, the new way of fighting wars. No Americans will die. Men here in Nevada or New York State or whatever can you know, play with their computers and drop bombs on people on the other side of the world. Uh, Jan and I have joined others who have been demonstrating every month for the last three years at the Beale Air Force Base in, uh, in California, which is one of the places that these drones are operating from. I, I will end by uh, just giving the sharing something that Johann Galtung, how many of you know who jo Johann Galtung is? He's one of the fathers, the parents of the uh, peace studies programs that are happening in this country and around the world. And he's worked in many conflict areas and mediated between conflicts, et cetera. He is saying the American empire will be over by 2020. Uh, that the people of the world are not gonna put up with continued American economic, military, political domination. And so the only real question is, are we going to have one war after another after another, kind of fighting to keep our power and our privilege and our uh, domination of other countries? Or are we going to join the world's people and say, uh, we want to live in a world where we really share <laughs> the world's resources and where uh, no, no country is going to be dominating, threatening, uh, occupying, uh, uh, other countries. So that's a little bit about my book. There are many, many more stories in my book. Uh, and I would love to open it up to questions and comments and discussion.
Who would like to ask the first question? Yeah, Bruce. Uh, thank you for your faith in me that I have some words of wisdom. Uh, in, my, in my book, at the end of the book, I have resources for further study and action, where I both uh, have what are some things that, that you can do, starting from very low risk uh, kinds of things to a higher risk. Um, I have uh, websites and books and uh, films uh, for people that want to you know, do further study uh, and get actively involved. And I have 10 lessons learned from my life of activism, which maybe most specifically uh, addresses your question. And I'll just outline those. One is the importance of vision, keeping, and keeping in mind where it is we're trying to go. You know, and when you're in the midst of a war and the bombs are falling, it's hard to do that. But I think it, Martin Luther King had a dream of his children being able to grow up as uh, citizen, uh, citizens with dignity in this country. And uh, that helped empower a lot of people. Second, the ones, oneness of all life, that we're all one human family. Uh, and if somebody in your family is, 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 is hungry, if they are suffering from war or injustice, you, know, you don't just say, well, tough, you're on the other side of the wall. <laughs> um, we do what we can to try to help. Uh, the belief that nonviolence is a powerful force. Uh, Gandhi said nonviolence is the most powerful force in the world, and I think that's accurate. And that people all over the world are organizing nonviolently to try to help uh, bring about change. Uh, nurture your spirit. Take time to, uh, whether it's through music, meditation, uh, spending time with friends, nurture your spirit. Uh, for the long haul. Uh, the belief that small, committed groups can, can create change. And as you know, Margaret Mead said, uh, never doubt that a small group of, of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Uh, uh, sixth, the need for sustained struggle. You know, doing something one day, two days, isn't going to do it. The, the 400,000 people that marched uh, several weeks ago in New York City, I think was a very important step, but it's going to take you know, more than a one big march to turn that around. The importance of good strategy. The military has been thinking strategically for a long time. Well, I think people who want to create a world of peace and justice need to think strategically. It's just as important. Uh, to develop long-range goals, develop good strategy, and, and sustain campaigns uh, to achieve those goals. Overcome our fear. I think fear is one of the greatest uh, inhibitors of, of action. And part of what I was trying to share with some of the stories, uh, you know, they say, if you don't do what we tell you, we're going to arrest you. Well, it's not necessarily the worst thing that can happen especially if you're arrested with other people who have some similar values and beliefs. You use that time to strengthen community and et cetera. Uh, the importance of truth. You know, I, I think uh, the people that are uh, encouraging wars often are re not relying on truth. Uh, and I think people in almost every society, our governments uh, resort to, war to lies to get the people to go along with those wars. Because the people don't want war. Uh, but we have to be relying on truth as, our, as a major part of our, you know, our uh, movement. And finally, we need to tell our stories. And that's part of what I'm trying to do with my book. Uh, I think we need to share the stories of that, that active nonviolence are things that people can do to bring about change. How many of you know the DVD, A Force More Powerful? Great. But this is a DVD professionally done. It's been on national television. Uh, it's six powerful movements around the world that have brought about major change. It's uh, Gandhi's Salt March. It's uh, the sit-ins in the South, or in segregation. It's nonviolent resistance to Hitler in Denmark. 
It's the solidarity movement, labor movement that uh, transformed uh, Poland. It's the nonviolent transformation of uh, South Africa. And it's the uh, nonviolent overthrow of Pinochet. So these ought to be shown in every church, every community, every university, you know, high school, to help people feel, oh, <laughs> there are other ways to help bring about change. So thanks for your question. Others? Yes. And it, you might just introduce or say who you are. Well, I think one is maybe trying to reframe. I mean, as, as I'm sure you know, 80 to 90% of the people that are dying in wars are civilians. Many, many of those, very high percentage, are children. I think that most people would argue, or would say, would believe, it, we don't want to kill anybody's children. <laughs> it's not worth killing somebody else's children for any ideology, you know, any political belief, uh, any religious <laughs> belief, uh, and yet that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, that, that fact is hidden from many of us, so I mean, that's, that's one thing. <clears throat> I think a second, uh, and the military industrial complex in this country has been very smart in, uh, in, uh, in parceling out the military contracts to make you know, these weapons of war to every congressional dist district in the United States. So in every congressional district, you know, there are people who say, we want our jobs. Uh, you know, so Mr. Congressman, get more jobs. <laughs> you know, and uh, I don't think that means that people want war. They do want jobs. And uh, in this world beyond war uh, effort that I, that I mentioned, we are uh, proposing uh, economic conversion commissions. And I think many of you probably know that the same amount of money spent on missiles, nuclear weapons, you know, all weapons of destruction, if used uh, building schools, you know, more teachers per, pass, per classroom, infrastructure rebuilding bridges that are falling, <laughs> uh, alternative energy technologies, et cetera, would provide many more jobs. Uh, so it's not, it's not a question of uh, jobs or no jobs, it's what kind of jobs. And um, I think the third thing that I would say is, I think empathy or trying to put ourselves in the other person's shoes is very important. And uh, if we, I, I don't think that there are many people who would say, I'm going to keep this job even if I know <laughs> that people in some other country are uh, going to get killed, who have nothing to do with, with, you know, with my security. <laughs> They're, you know, people trying to bring up their families uh, and want the same things as I do. I, I mean, I believe enough in the goodness of human nature. I don't think people like the idea of killing other people. And that's the reason, part of the reason that soldiers coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam are having such a hard time. And they become alcoholic, and they kill themselves, and they are in, end up in mental institutions and prisons um, because they've had to. I mean, they were brought up that you know we <laughs> we we get along with people, and then you learn you've got to kill people, uh, and and you get a medal if you kill you know a whole lot of people, and, and then you come back home and you're supposed to forget that, <laughs> and and that transition is very very hard. So, uh, and I guess the final thing I would say is military security has not been working. I mean, September 11th, 2001, a horrendous thing happened. You know, terrorists hijacked planes and uh, three or 4,000 people died. But in response, we have, we have been at war with uh, Afghanistan for 13 years, with Iraq for, 12, for 11 years, and I would guess that we have a thousand times as many terrorists now as we did when we started. 
And if we keep the continuing our present policies, we'll have a thousand times as many as we have now, five years from now. And so that's a dead end street. And uh, my own feeling is we need to try something different. <laughs> and that is instead of being at war with the Muslim world, especially, uh, that we, uh, I'm one of the things that irks them most is our military bases in their countries and our occupation of their countries and our supporting Israel 100% against the Palestinians. And if instead we said we're withdrawing our troops, we're dismantling our military bases, we're going to put the hundreds of billions of dollars we've been spending in war into medical clinics, Peace Corps people, uh, educational institutions, uh, we could become the most loved nation in the world and I think be a whole lot safer. Other questions? Comments? And feel free to disagree <laughs> with anything I've said. Well, if not, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. And um, if, if you haven't already gotten a book, I uh, hope you'll buy a book. And I, if you're older, like I am, uh, think about your children and grandchildren. Uh, that Christmas is going to be coming before too long. And I think it's especially important that younger people feel some hope for something that we can do to help create a more peaceful, just world for our children and grandchildren. Yes? Uh, John Lewis, uh, I, I'm sure there are. I don't have them in my head. Um, but uh, John Lewis, who, uh, as you may remember, is now a member of Congress and was a part of the Nashville sit-ins, uh, was a part of the Freedom Rides, and was part of the, when the bus, buses were burned and people were beaten up. He and other Nashville students said, we're gonna, we're gonna, we've written our wills and we're going to go down and continue <laughs> the Freedom Ride. He was brutally bur uh, beat up. He was also in the front of the line in the Selma, uh, the Selma to Montgomery March, and was badly beaten by the police. There's a, uh, what's it called? Graphic novel, uh, and it's called March. And there's the first one, March 1, is out, but there's going to be two more. And they kind of share the story of the whole, of his experience in the Civil Rights Movement from a very, very courageous guy. Um, and I think that is certainly, that's something that's available for young people. I think uh, it depends on what age you're talking about. But this video, or the DVD I, I, I shared, is certainly also very appropriate for high schools and, and, and our Sunday school. Well, thanks everyone for coming, and um, I'll be happy to sign some books if, if you'd like me to. Thank you.